exalt Thee. We exalt Thee. We exalt Thee. Oh Lord, we exalt Thee. We exalt Thee. We exalt Thee. Oh, Lord. I love you, Jesus. You're great and greatly to be praised. Exalt Thee. We exalt Thee. We Exalt Thee, O Lord, we exalt Thee, we exalt Thee, we your hands and sing this to the Lord one more time. We exalt Thee. We exalt Thee. We exalt Thee. Oh, your name tonight. So we exalt we exalt I love you, Jesus. I worship you tonight. Oh, hallelujah. What a privilege to be in your house, Lord. What a privilege to be in your presence. What a privilege to be with your people. What a privilege to open up your word. What a privilege to exalt and magnify and glorify your name, Jesus. We worship you tonight. Oh, God, rush into this chapel, I pray. Be with us in our Bible study. Speak to us, God. Open our understanding. Let us hear your word. Let us learn. Help us to grow in our relationship with you and with one another. Bless the name of the Lord Jesus. Praise God. Praise God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. I don't know if you've already done this, but I encourage you to do it. If you haven't had your family devotion or if you live by yourself where you... Just call somebody up who might also live by themselves and encourage them based on what we, what we learned on Sunday. We had our family devotion last night and our girls just weighed in on how can we make sure that we follow Jesus all the way. We don't walk away from him if he disappoints us or if he doesn't answer our prayers like we expect. Kind of like what happened in the, in the story in John 12 where they cry Hosanna that on Sunday, crucify him on Friday, all because Jesus either disappointed them, offended them, or just he didn't do what they thought he should, and so they decided, I'd rather not follow. So I, if you would, make sure you have your time where you continue the conversation. Ask them what did it mean for them, what does it mean for us, and how do we apply it in our lives today. Make sure we follow him all the way. So as we've been learning in Sunday school, being a good leader doesn't mean you're a good dad. We know Jacob was a terrible dad. Isaac wasn't any better. Abraham wasn't the best. Yeah, he, he kicks one son out and tries to kill another. 
Now, of course, the, the one was on, by orders of the Lord. David was a bad dad. Eli was a bad dad. Samuel was a bad dad. Part of it has to do with favoritism. Parents aren't supposed to have favorite kids. Right. But come on, let's be honest. That's right. Parents have favorite kids. <laughs> Doctors aren't supposed to have favorite patients. Nurses aren't supposed to have favorite patients, but sometimes they do. Sure do. Shepherds aren't supposed to have favorite sheep, but they do. Missionaries aren't supposed to have favorite cities, but they do. It would appear the city of Ephesus was one of Paul's favorite cities, one of Paul's favorite churches. He spent more time in Ephesus than he spent anywhere else. He spent three years in Ephesus discipling and ministering in the church in Ephesus. Paul's just wrapped up his second missionary journey, and here we are in Acts 19. He's launched from Antioch, come through here and encouraged and strengthened the churches here, but he really can't wait to get to here, Ephesus. He just loves Ephesus. He was there the last time, but he was only there for a short time, and he said, don't worry, guys, I will be back. Around that time, Ephesus boasted around 300,000 people. That's a lot of people. That's 18 Mount Vernons. Wow. <laughs> That's a big city. Wow. Ephesus was home to harbors, as you can see right there on the coast, and it was home to its claim to fame, the Temple of Diana which was one of, the, one of the wonders of the ancient world. The Temple of Diana was right at 100,000 square feet. I think our building, I'm pretty sure our building is 6,400 square feet on this side and on that side. So our building is right at 12,000 square feet. The Temple of Diana is 100,000. That's a massive building. 100 columns, each one 50 feet high. It was a wonder. Diana, looking around to see if we have any under 18s, Diana was a fertility goddess, so temple prostitution was rampant, male and female prostitutes all throughout the city of Ephesus, making money off of the temple of Diana. So that was the kind of city Ephesus was. Ephesus wasn't family friendly, but it was a great place to plant a church because they needed to hear the gospel. And it happened at verse number one. If you have your Bible, we're going to read out of Acts 19. And it happened while Apollos was at Corinth that Paul... Having passed through the upper regions, came to Ephesus, and finding some disciples, he said to them, Hey, boys, have you received the Holy Spirit since you believed? And they said to him, What? We've done so much as heard whether there be a Holy Spirit. So he said, Okay, let's go back to the beginning. How are you baptized? They said, Oh, good, John's baptism. And Paul said, Oh, not good. John baptized under repentance, saying to the people they should believe on him who should come after him, that is, on Christ Jesus. Now, when they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul laid his hands on them, they spoke with tongues and prophesied. Now the men were about 12 in all. <coughs> we Bible quizzed over this way back in the day, back in the 90s, when poofs were popular. <laughs> and when we studied this in King James, do you remember how it read? Uh, no. And all the men <laughs> were about 12. Oh, yeah, like and I thought, that's kind of young for a man. All of them are 12 years old. That just simply means there were 12 of them, 12 of these disciples. Yeah. Paul knows what's going on. I had no clue. I'm like, well, all the men were about 12. Well, I'm 12, so clearly I'm a man. <laughs> Paul's... Voice was a lot higher <laughs> it was more like this. I'm 13, so simply I'm a man. <laughs> a lisp and a lateral, a lateral lisp and a soprano voice. I was not voted most popular. So Paul leaves Antioch. He comes through Phrygia and Galatia. He's strengthening and encouraging and discipling the churches there. And then he gets over to Ephesus and he's headed for the big city. He gets there, he finds 12 disciples. One translation calls them disciples, another calls them brothers, another calls them believers. And there's debate on whether they are believers in Jesus or John the Baptist. But nevertheless, they have some faith, faith in God for sure. And they have faith likely in Jesus. They just, much like Apollos in Acts 18, God had more for them. They hadn't gone quite far enough. So Paul asks them an interesting and telling question. He asks them, have you received the Holy Spirit since you believed? Now, Paul, there's a tie for him between faith and receiving the Spirit. What is that tie? Is it that we receive the Holy Spirit immediately when we believe? Or is it possible that we can believe and not be filled with the Spirit until a later point in time? Which is, which is the case? The latter. You guys want to climb the ladder? The latter. There's clearly, as in this case, 
there's this understanding that you can believe. You can believe Jesus came, died, buried, rose from the grave. You can believe Jesus is the Messiah. You can believe Jesus is coming back. But that doesn't mean you've received the Holy Spirit yet. You might, you might have, at the point of belief, you may, but you also may not. So the Holy Spirit does not automatically fall on us when we believe. So they give him a blank stare. He says, have you received the Holy Spirit since they believe? And they just look at him and say, what? When I was in my junior year of college, it was my hardest year. I almost dropped out. It was just so difficult. And one class was marriage and family class with Dr. Littles, which he was a good professor, but he was a tough one. I had a project due the next morning, and so, of course, I, I waited until the last hour and stayed up all night, drank a lot of Mountain Dew, finished around 2 or 3 in the morning, finished that project, was so glad, so relieved, got some sleep, woke up the next morning walking out of my dorm room toward general epistles class when a, a gentleman from across the hall comes out of his dorm room and says, hey, bro, did you get your general epistles term paper done? And I gave him the blank stare. We have not so much as heard whether there be a general epistles term paper. I completely forgot. I was so wrapped up in the marriage and family project, I forgot about the general epistles term paper. So I gave the blank stare. What term paper? That's what they gave to Paul. Or Paul. Yeah, to Paul. What Holy Spirit? So Paul goes back and says, okay, let's go back a little bit to the beginning. How were you baptized? And they smiled and they nodded. They said, yes, sir, we were baptized. Indeed, we were. We were baptized under John's baptism. And Paul said, well, good but God has more for you. And he said, John baptized under repentance, which is good. But the name of Jesus was not caught over you. And Paul pointed out that John himself pointed and said, now you listen to me as long as I'm here, but as soon as he comes, you listen to him. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. And they heard this and immediately their faith kicked in and they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Paul laid his hands on them and the Holy Spirit fell on them and they begin to speak with tongues and prophesy right at there in one fell swoop at the beginning of Acts 19. You have these believers who have believed but not been baptized in Jesus' name or filled with the Spirit, but immediately after Paul preaches to them the gospel, they are both baptized in Jesus' name and baptized in the Spirit. These first seven verses are a treasure trove of teaching. First of all, it is possible to believe without being Spirit-filled. It's possible for somebody to say, I believe Jesus is the Christ. Good. That's wonderful. Have you received the Spirit yet? That's exactly what's going on here. Do Dr. Ben Witherington, who is not apostolic Pentecostal, he said, for Luke, if one is without the Spirit, one is not a Christian. And that's exactly what Romans 8, 9 says. If any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he's none of his. But there are certainly more passages, and he lists them right there, that says in order to be a true follower of Jesus, to really be born again of water and spirit. We need to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And we see this pattern all throughout the book of Acts. Acts chapter 8, they believed in, what was the city? Where was he preaching? Philip was preaching too. The Samaritans, yes. And the Bible says they believed Philip preaching concerning the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, and they were baptized, and they had joy, and they had miracles, and yet they did not have the spirit yet. Acts chapter 18 we have our good friend, who, whom did we learn about last week at the very end of 18? And Aquila and Priscilla said, hey, did you know God has more for you? Apollos, Apollos, the silver-tongued orator from Alexandria, Egypt, very educated, very well-spoken, very articulate, but very not filled with the Spirit yet. And so he believed, he had a faith in Jesus, but he had not yet responded to the gospel. And then here we are in Acts 19, same scenario. We have these 12 disciples who although they have believed and although they have even repented and been baptized under John's baptism have not yet been filled with the Spirit. So it's possible for churches all around us to believe in Jesus, to believe he is the Messiah, and yet just like these groups here, not yet be filled with the Spirit. That's why it's our privilege to be able to say when somebody asks us about our experience, we can say, would you believe it if I told you God has more for you? Which is what Aquila and Priscilla did for Apollos. Secondly, this teaches us that it's possible to be rebaptized. Now, some guys have come from Celebrate Recovery, and they, they come, they do really well, and then they have a tough time, and they come back maybe three or four, two or three years later, and they say, you know what, I need to get baptized again because I want to get the sin off. You don't need to be rebaptized in that case. You just need to repent. But if somebody has never been baptized in the name of Jesus, and these guys were not, 
Paul said you need to be. There have been people who have been baptized because it's all they knew or all their pastor taught in the titles Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. But as we've looked throughout the book of Acts, and we'll look out throughout the, the epistles all the way from Romans to Revelation, nobody in the New Testament church is ever baptized calling on the titles Father, Son, and Spirit. It's always, without exception, in the name of Jesus Christ. Yes, ma'am? What happened in 325 A.D.? The Council of Nicaea. Sir? Yeah. The Ni 325 A.D., the Council of Nicaea came together. Constantine, who was the emperor of, of that area, just did not like all the bickering among the Christians and said, let's get you two together. So he got two guys, Arius and Athanasius. One guy believed that God is divided into three persons. Another guy believed that God sent somebody else. And so they, they came together. The only two views in that council, were the, those were the only two views that had a chance to argue with each other, but they weren't the only two views there in that day. But after that, for some reason, and I don't know why, the Christian world has gone after this idea that there's a Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, separate persons, same God, separate persons, and they've come up with this idea of a trinity. But it's church history. It's not Bible. In fact, how many of you remember from last week when those two Bible scholars, N.T. Wright and F.F. F. Bruce, both of them very respected and renowned Bible scholars, but not apostolic Pentecostal, both conceded that baptism was only in the name of Jesus until it was later changed. F.F. F. Bruce and N.T. Wright were both of the ones who said that. Oh, Constantine? Alexander the Great? I was <laughs> he hadn't yet met Jesus, but he has now. So that's why people have, they go to church history. I had a friend of mine recently, a, a local pastor, and a great guy, wonderful guy, loves people, loves God, and he asked me, what creeds do you guys go by? You go by the Nicene Creed, you go by the Apostolic Creed, what creeds do you guys go by? And I said, well, and I wasn't being arrogant, I said, we don't, we don't really go by creeds, the only the only authority in, for us is the Word of God, the inspired, infallible Word of God. So that's, but, but many Christians have gotten caught up in this idea of church history being authoritative, but it's not. I'm glad for what church history has given us, but it's not inerrant, it's not authoritative, it's not infallible, and it's certainly in this case not even correct. So that's in my, I believe that's why, even though they look at all the mounting evidence in the New Testament, they still say, yeah, but they said that back in 325, so we're going with it. Which, just side note, this is, we, it wasn't even decided 325, 380 A.D., finally they decided the Holy Spirit was good enough to make the team. So it, it's just a mess. But, so that's possible. But the point here is in Acts 19, it is possible, it is scriptural, it is biblical to be rebaptized if somebody has not yet been baptized in the name of Jesus. Or, even if they have, let's say they were five years old and they got baptized but didn't really understand it is possible, and people have come and said, you know, I got baptized when I was a kid. I didn't get it. I didn't know it. I just got baptized because my buddies were. I want to do this for me, not for them, and then I'll rebaptize them in that case. But if somebody just comes and says, I've sinned a lot. I want to get baptized again. No need. Just repent. But for the sake of those who have never been baptized in Jesus' name before, definitely be baptized. Questions about all of that? It's a treasure trove of teaching, doctrine right here in Acts 19 in the very beginning. All right, verse 8, and he went into the synagogue. No surprise there, right? Paul was very predictable. He spoke boldly for three months, reasoning and persuading concerning the things of the kingdom of God. But when some were hardened and did not believe, no surprise there. They spoke evil of the way before the multitude, and Paul departed from them and withdrew the disciples, reasoning daily in the school of Tyrannus. And this continued for two years, so that all who dwelt in Asia heard the word of the Lord Jesus, both Jews and and Greeks. So Paul has had his little revival here with the 12 disciples. He comes in to the synagogue, teaches there, and after three months, the Jews have had enough of him and his gospel. They hardened their hearts, they folded their arms, they shook their heads, and then they started speaking evil of, I love what the New Testament culture called the Christians, the way. I love that. That's beautiful. They started speaking evil of the way, spreading lies about it, spreading rumors about the way. And so Paul said, fine, 
We'll get out of the way and we will go from here. So they get out of the way and they go to the school of Tyrannus. Now, Tyrannus was either a philosopher or a teacher or probably owned the school. But Paul rented from him for two years. And one source says Paul rented the school of Tyrannus every day from 11 a.m. to 4 p.m. Well, that's a weird time slot. But that was the heat of the day. And so this was their siesta. This is when most of them would stop working in the sun in the fields and they would go home and take a nap. And then would come back around four and they'd finish. So Tyrannus taught his class from whenever, 6 a.m. is the Jewish day starts, but whenever he would start, he would start and then teach until 11. Paul would get the room from 11 to four and then Tyrannus would come and finish up his class in the evening. So he gives Paul the off-peak hours and says, here, you can have it when everybody's going home taking a nap. Good luck getting an audience. But here, during these off-peak hours, when anybody who wanted to hear Paul had to really want to hear Paul, because this is nap time, and you're cutting into their nap time. But they came and hear, heard him, and in two years, the Scripture says, all of Asia, both Jews and Greeks, heard the word of the Lord. That's amazing. During off-peak hours, renting a room, two years all of Asia heard the word of the Lord. Where were the churches we read about in Revelation? We studied Revelation. Where were the churches located to whom John wrote in Revelation? They were located in Asia. Many believe that this is the time these churches, Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamos, Thyatira, all of these were founded during this two years when Paul was teaching in the school of Tyrannus. Now, does Paul go out and plant all these churches? We don't know, but we don't have reference that he does. does. Does all of Asia come to the school of Tyrannus and hear Paul? Then how does all of Asia hear the word? That's, that's why Liz is like, this is what you're doing. This is what I need you to do. This is what you're doing. This is what I need you to do. They would come to the school of Tyrannus. God would change their life. They would hear the gospel and they would go out and they would share it with others. And so all of Asia heard the word, not because Paul necessarily taught it, not because Paul necessarily planted all of those churches, but because somebody heard the gospel, went home and told somebody else, and they planted the church. So that's how it happens. We disciple others, and they disciple others. And John wrote to the seven churches which are in Asia. This could have been the time those churches were founded. Now, God worked unusual miracles by the hands of Paul, so that even handkerchiefs or aprons were brought from his body to the sick, and the diseases left them and the evil spirits went out of them. Then some of the itinerant Jewish exorcists took it upon themselves to call the name of the Lord Jesus. You just know this is disaster. Over those who had evil spirits saying, we exorcise you by the Jesus Paul preaches. Also, there were seven sons of Sceva. That's hard to say with a lisp, and I did it before. <laughs> and they said, or rather, a Jewish chief priest who did so. And the evil spirit answered and said, Jesus I know, Paul I know, but who are you? And the man in whom the evil spirit was leaped on them, overpowered them, prevailed against them, so they fled out of the house naked and wounded. Naked, naked exactly. This became both known to all the Jews and Greeks dwelling in Ephesus. Fear fell on all of them, and the name of the Lord Jesus was magnified. So things are about to get unusualer. Paul has been teaching in, in the school of Tyrannus, and people have been coming and hearing the gospel. And I know every time I think of Tyrannus, I want to finish it off with Osaurus. Well, yeah, exactly. But, and ironically, his, his, name, his name means tyrant. Wow. Yeah. So what parent? What, why would you name your child why? tyrant? Why? Why would you give it a goal? Look at him. Isn't he a sweet? Isn't he a sweet little tyrant? Look at our sweet little tyrant. He's going to wreak havoc everywhere. So, <laughs> Paul was teaching, and somebody requested prayer. Probably wasn't much different from our services, where somebody would say, hey, hey, I would pray for my uncle, pray for my dad, pray for my daughter, pray for my mother, pray for my sister. Pray, pray that God would touch them. Paul said, okay, yeah, let's say, we'll do, we'll pray. And then they said, you know what, we'd like you to give us some kind of token. We want to take something to them that just kind of shows them you prayed for them. You, Paul, prayed for them. 
And so scripture says they took handkerchiefs and aprons. Now, when I think of a handkerchief, I think of some of those Victorian type times. So the lady walks away with a handkerchief, nice crisp handkerchief and a parasol in one hand. And it's all nice and sanitized and sweet. The word handkerchief means sweat rag or headband. I want you to think about it. Paul's a leather worker. Paul's a tent maker. Paul's wrestling leather and forming saddles and all of that in the hot blazing sun. And he's got a sweat rag wrapped around his head to keep the sweat from getting in his eyes. And Paul says, here, take this. Now, when I preach, I have a handkerchief just to dab a little sweat in case I get all worked up. Nobody has ever come to me after a service and said, LJ, could I have that sweaty handkerchief? I want to take it home to my grandmother. She needs healing. Nobody's ever said that. We sanitize things. We have prayer cloths. We have these nice little cut prayer cloths with scripture on them. We dab a little oil on We pray over them and we give them to somebody. They take them. Now, here's where we, this story, this reference is where we get the idea of prayer cloths that we take something, a token to somebody who can't come here, we take it to them. And why do we do that? What, what's the purpose of taking some kind of token to somebody else who can't be here to be prayed for themselves? In what way? Faith builder in, in what way? Okay, so this is a way of telling them, we were praying for you. This is a tangible way and a reminder. Mama? So, this, yeah, this is a tangible reminder that somebody's been praying for you, somebody cares. If I were to bring a prayer cloth to someone and we socially do that, I've gone about it from my pastor and shared with my pastor what I want prayed about. So, I mean, it's kind of, you know, I guess I could get in my Amazon and start passing. Right. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that is, you know. That's right. <laughs> yes. But, uh, you know, if I, if, if, if Teresa came to me and said, hey, Right. This is a shared prayer that she wants to, you know, so I know that it's not just her, that she's taking her time out to go to someone for this prayer to bring to the kingdom. Exactly. There's, there's this understanding that there are people out there I may never have met, or maybe I have, but they're praying for me. Missy? The scripture just came to my mind that if two or three are gathered together, and this is a way that they could be gathered together with those people who don't know. Sure. Yeah, even though distance or disease or, se or whatever separates us, this is a way of bringing us together. Absolutely. Now, Ephesus, as we're going to see in a moment, was a magic city. And not magic in a good way, like, well, it's a magical place. They loved magic. They loved magic charms. They loved talismans and incantations and spells and all that. So when they saw this, they might have thought these prayer claws are magical. These sweat rags that are healing people are magical, but are they? Where does the power come to heal the sick and cast out the devils? In the name of Jesus. The power comes from the one who hears and answers the prayer. The prayer cloths are a great token. But if you can't get a prayer cloth, you pray. And if you can't, if, if you give somebody, I had one lady had, taken some prayer claws, and she had actually, when I went to visit her, she had actually clipped them to her shirt, kind of as a way of reminding herself that I've got people praying for me. Uh -huh. So it was a faith builder for her, and it was a reminder that people are praying. But this is where we get it. Prayer claws don't heal anybody. God does. So they're simply a token of prayers that people have prayed. And this is the first miracle. Now, the other thing they took from Paul were aprons, which were pretty much the aprons he would wear around his waist when he would be working as a leather worker. So, I mean, you're taking basically his headband and his tool belt and like, here you go. Praise the Lord. So that's, that's how it all works. So these guys, seven sons of Sceva, they see this and they say, wow. How are they casting these devils out? Well, they're casting them out by calling on the name of Jesus. I can do that. And so they say all the right words. I command you in the name of Jesus Christ, whom Paul preaches, which is true. This is the Jesus Paul preaches, to come out. But the problem is they have no relationship with the Jesus right. they're calling on. None at all. 
And this is not that they're calling on God for repentance or forgiveness, that God would respond in that way. They are calling on God. They want his power without having any relationship with him. And Jesus says, <laughs> doesn't work that way. So the devil responds and says, and here's in the King James, the New King James, it's very similar. Jesus, I know, Paul, I know, who are you? In the, the original language, it sounds like this. I know Jesus. <laughs> I know him very well. We all know Jesus. And we are acquainted with Paul. One translation says we respect Paul. It's not the same knowledge of Jesus. We're acquainted with Paul. We know Jesus. Yeah, we're acquainted with Paul. But I've never heard of you. Who are you? It would be, it would be pretty amazing if hell knew who we are. Yeah. I was making the bed a while ago and I got down on my knees to tuck in the sheet beneath the mattress, and the thought hit me. I wonder if the devil just shuddered a little <laughs> to see me back on my knees and then went, oh, phew, he's just making the bed. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> That's awesome, yes. Yeah. Oh, that we had so much power with God yes. that when you get down on your knees to tuck in the sheet beneath the mattress, the devil says, uh-oh, what's going to happen now? Right. And then just goes, whew. Thank me, he's just making the bed. <laughs> it would be amazing to be known in hell. Of course, we're known in heaven. Thank God for that. Yes. But I think it'd be awesome to be known in hell. To be somebody whose prayers affect such change in heaven and eternity that the devil would say, oh no, they're up. Brother, Brother Huntley prays this prayer over his grandchildren. He says, God, help them to honor heaven and horrify hell. That's right. Ah, I'm not looking for trouble, but I wouldn't mind if hell knew who we are. Sir? I, I just always like to look at it historically. And even, even if you were to take a secular historical view on it, uh, you know, a book of Satan, that if under persecution we pop up religion, the way it spreads <laughs> Not that I know of. Okay, so, but I'm trying to think the year that Islam, because to me I'm just thinking like the devil's like, well, you started this whole movement under persecution in the name of Jesus and peace, so I'm going to come in with a sword. Sure. And perverse, because you know, Islam is a, right. and it's prophesized in the Old Testament, descendants of the Asian mm -hmm. conflict. My history is but, you know, fuzzy. So you have it, you know, they're going by the sword and gathering, you know, yeah. mm -hmm. forcing people where sure. Christianity is <clears throat> spreading. Sure, exactly. Where, you know, you have Nero burning people. And right. Yeah. It just keeps going. It just keeps, <laughs> even though they're persecuted, they're still growing, spreading. All of Asia hears the word in two years. Yeah. All of Asia. And here's what's amazing. They, they, they affect amazing amounts of change without one picket sign one protest, one riot, no parade. They're just preaching the gospel. Mm -hmm. And the people hear the gospel, are convicted of sin, repent, change their ways. And nobody has to picket, protest, or parade, or riot. It's just that's the power of the gospel. So these seven sons of Sceva say, we can do that. We, we command you by the name of Jesus, whom Paul preaches. And the devil says, yeah, I know Jesus. I'm acquainted with Paul. I don't know who you are. I don't know who you are. You have no power with Jesus. And so they attack him or yeah. them, beat them up, strip them, send them out of the house, streaking and wounded down the street. And now everybody, everybody, <laughs> don't look at them. Everybody is magnifying God because it's clear he's the one in charge, not the devil, not the magic, not any of that. Jesus is the one in charge. Any questions before we go on to verse 18? So here's what the gospel does. And here's what the demonstration, miraculous demonstration does. Many who had believed came confessing and telling their deeds. Also, many of those who had practiced magic brought their books together and burned them in the sight of all. And they counted up the value of them. And it totaled 50,000 pieces of silver. Wow. So the word of the Lord grew mightily 
and prevailed. This is another one of Luke's progress reports. He's letting know, hey, by the way, after all that happened, <laughs> well, still grew, just as Daniel said, and prevailed. They, they realized our witches, our warlocks, our sorcerers, our magic tricks, all of that, that has no power. The only power is found in the name of Jesus. So they brought their books of spells and magic and incantations and curses, and they burned them. Now, we have seen this, not this demonstration, but we have seen a sorcerer who was in tap with the devil. We have seen him respond and repent before. Where did we see that? Where have we seen it was Acts 8 in Samaria. We saw Simon the sorcerer who used to wow the whole city, had deceived the whole city into thinking he was somebody great. But when he came face to face with the real power of God, Simon could never make the lame leap or never make the blind see. But Philip preaching the name of Jesus did. Philip didn't, but the name of Jesus did as he preached it. And so that's when Simon realized that's power. This isn't power. I want that. So we see that here again in Ephesus. All the people, they brought their magic books, they burned them. Luke adds it all up. Luke was incredibly good with record keeping. Luke adds it up. He said there were 50,000 pieces of silver. A couple ways they could, they, they counted up the coins were drachmas or denarius. Most likely this is the denarius, which was the coin in their day. If so, 50,000 pieces of silver added up to 137 years of a working man's wage. Boy, that's a lot of books. I thought, my goodness, how many people are practicing magic in Ephesus? Good work. They brought all those books together. They burned all of those books. Ephesus is having revival. The Lord is being magnified. The word of the Lord is growing mightily, is prevailing. But as we learned last week, where there is revival, there is always trouble, persecution, trouble. And here comes trouble. When these things were accomplished, Paul purposed in the spirit when he had gone through Macedonia and Achaia to go to Jerusalem, saying, after there I must go to Rome. This is the first time we ever hear Paul wanting to go to Rome. <laughs> he gets his wish, but not like he wanted. So he sent into Macedonia two of those who ministered to him, Timothy and Erastus, but he stayed in Asia. About that time there rose a great commotion about the way. Here comes trouble. Certain man named Demetrius, a silversmith, he made silver shrines of Diana which brought no small profit to the craftsmen. Luke tells us his motive is what? Money. Money. He doesn't care about religion, faith, righteousness. All he cares about is, I got to make some more denarii. So he calls them together, workers of similar occupation, and said, men, you know that we have our prosperity by this trade. Moreover, you see and hear that not only Ephesus, listen to what he charges Paul with, but almost all Asia, this Paul has persuaded and turned away many people, saying they are not gods which are made with hands. So not only is this trade of ours in danger of falling into disrepute, but also the temple of the great goddess Diana may be despised in her magnificence. Did it not go? There we go. Sorry. But also the temple of the great goddess Diana may be despised in her, hear this, her magnificence could be destroyed. If she's really magnificent, do you need to hold her up? No. Whom all Asia and the world worship. So Demetrius, not Caldwell, Demetrius the silversmith, gets his buddies together and says, listen, guys, we're all going to be out of a job. We're going to be at bread lines if we don't stop Paul. Paul has persuaded almost all of Asia about this Jesus. And if we don't do something, we'll all be looking for work. And worse yet, everybody knows, everybody worships Diana, and she's the one who makes us the money. But not for long if we don't do something about it. Now, he didn't mean it as a compliment, but what a compliment it was. What high praise to be able to say that if we don't do something about these people, they're going to change the world. Yeah, I'll tell it. I'll just won't, I won't use names to protect the innocent. It would be great if we were making such a difference in our city that a group of people had to get together behind closed doors and say, what are we going to do about ACC? And you know what? That happened. That happened. We were making such a difference in celebrate, through Celebrate Recovery and through Sunday services, ministering to people, God transforming their lives, that there was a group of men who got together. I heard about it after the fact 
who got to have, get together behind closed doors and said, we've got to do something about ACC. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. So they did that there. They, they got together and said, we've got to do something about this guy. If we don't do something about it, he's going to change the world. His gospel is going to get all around the world, and we're going to be out of a job. Nobody's going to worship Diana anymore. They're all going to worship this one called Jesus. So with all this revival comes trouble, but this is a fight worth fighting. So when they heard this, they were full of wrath, and they cried out, saying, Great is Diana of the Ephesians. So the whole city was filled with confusion, and they rushed into the theater with one accord, having seized Gaius and Aristarchus, Macedonians, Paul's travel companions. The theater would seat 25,000. The, if you just can, nationwide arena will seat around 16 or 17,000, where the Oklahoma City Thunder play, where we had Youth Congress, would seat 17,000. So just to give you an idea, this theater where they rushed into, where they filled up, would see 25,000, bigger than an NBA arena. Just, it was a massive place. So when Paul wanted to go into the people, the disciples would not allow him, and some of the officials of Asia, who were his friends, sent to him pleading that he would not venture into the theater. Some therefore cried one thing and some another, for the assembly was confused. I love this line, and most of them, they don't even know why they're there. So they drew Alexander out of the multitude. The Jews put him forward, and Alexander motioned with his hand and wanted to make his defense to the people. But when they found out he was a Jew, all of them with one voice cried out for about two hours, great is Diana of the Ephesians. So the crowd goes from crowd to mob in one second. And remember what Ralph Waldo Emerson said about a mob? A mob is a people, a society of people who voluntarily bereave themselves of reason or common sense. You're just going to set aside, you know what, for a moment, I'm just going to go out of my mind, and I'm going to go over here. Yeah. <laughs> That's exactly what they do. They nab two of Paul's pals. They drag them into the arena. They're screaming, great is Diana of the Ephesians. Great is Diana of the Ephesians. And Paul wants to go in. Paul was always that type A go-getter kind of guy. Paul thinks, hey, let me go in. I'll explain everything. 25,000 rabid, wrathful, foaming at the mouth, frothing Ephesians. And Paul says, I'll calm them down. <laughs> Cooler heads prevail. They keep Paul away from the arena. Like, if you want to come out of that arena, you're not going to go into it. So they keep him out of the arena. And Alexander raises his hand to stop everything and says, Hey, guys, 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 listen, 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 listen. You know, and as soon as he starts speaking, somebody yells out, He's a Jew! And they go nuts. They shut him down, and they scream for two solid hours. Greatest Diana of the Ephesians, greatest Diana of the Ephesians, great, just chanting over and over and over and over again. And it's so interesting what, what Luke writes. He writes, they were so confused. One said this thing, another said another, and they didn't even know why they were there. It reminds me a little bit of some of the riots of 2020, when just popped up everywhere. Yeah. Almost like they were Dunkin' Donuts, just popping up everywhere. That is, I, I apologize. Father, forgive me. <laughs> and they didn't even know why they were mad. They were so upset, so angry, enraged, veins bulging, fists pumping, and somebody would say, what's wrong with you? I, I'm just mad. What do you want to change? I, something needs to change. They don't know. They have no idea why they're mad. So they scream out, greatest Diana of the Ephesians. Here's the tragedy about all that. Two hours, they scream out, greatest Diana of the Ephesians, and Diana never hears one second of it. And the reason Paul is so grieved and provoked when he walks through Athens and he walks through Corinth and he walks through Ephesus and sees all the idolatry is he knows you can pray all day long until you don't have a voice left and that God of stone or silver or gold or wood or brass won't hear one single prayer and can't heal one single sickness but you whisper the name of Jesus one time. And he's right there. We were having an amazing time last night in the jail. We were, I was sharing with them the Easter story, the gospel, and telling them the story. And they started, it was, it was awesome to watch them as they were responding. They were sitting there on broken blue chairs. And some of those guys were sitting there like this. Wow. Listening. One of the guys had his head in his hands. And Andrea just asked the question, have you guys ever heard this before? And half of them 
More than half of them just shook their head and said, I've never heard this story. And so they're in a jail right before the power went out. They're in the jail. I'm sharing this simple gospel story. <laughs> yeah, we're sitting there. I'm sharing the Easter story, the gospel, telling about the empty tomb, and all of a sudden, boom, no lights. It was. Here's what's amazing about it, though. We weren't scared. It was kind of like maybe like it was in Paul's day in Acts 16, where the earthquakes, everybody's chains fall off, and they don't go anywhere. They just sit there. Yeah. Yeah. And one of the guys said something like, he, he's mentioned something about, yeah, when you call on the name of Jesus, boom. It was like, wow. <laughs> so, but what was amazing is there was no fear. We were just sitting there, and the guys are right there in front of us, and it was like, oh, what was that? And I went to check the light switch. It was still on, and I looked out. I saw the power was out everywhere. I said, oh, anyways. So Mary Magdalene goes to the tomb in the morning and just kept on teaching. And it was, it was pretty cool. But, but in, that, in that service, as they heard the, the story of the gospel, some of them for the very first time, one of the young men before he left, big, tall guy, strong guy, he came up and gave me a hug, and he's weeping on my shoulder. And then he let go of me for a second. And then he went back in, and he gave me a hug again. And God touched him in a simple jail service in less than maybe... 20 minutes of telling the, the gospel story. God touched his heart. Two hours of screaming, great is Diana the Ephesians, and she never hears one single syllable. But you just whisper the name of Jesus, and he's right there. It's like Paul said in Acts 17, if you would just feel after him, you're going to find he's not far from any one of us. Hallelujah. Praise God. So then after, Deme after Alexander tries and he fails, then the city clerk gets up. One translation says he was the mayor. And he quiets the crowd. He says, men of Ephesus, what man is there do not know that the city of the Ephesians is the temple guardian of the great goddess Diana in the image which fell down from Zeus. Therefore, since these things cannot be denied, you ought to be quiet and do nothing rashly. For you have brought these men who are neither robbers of our temple or blasphemers of your goddess. Therefore, if Demetrius and his fellow craftsmen have a case against anyone, the courts are open. You guys got a problem? Go settle them in court. Get out of the arena. You're getting on my nerves. But if you have any other inquiry to make, it shall be determined of a lawful assembly. Because, guys, if you don't stop this, the Romans are going to come in. And if the Romans come in and ask us why we're all worked up and you can't explain why you're worked up justifiably, we're all in trouble. So go home. And when he told them that, he dismissed. And they went home. 25,000 rabid, frothing, foaming at the mouth, angry fans realized, what, we could get in trouble by the Romans? <laughs> See ya. See ya. <laughs> this is a win for the gospel. We learned that when, when the proconsul of Achaia ruled that it was okay for Paul and his pals to preach the gospel, that was precedent that any time they would go into another city, and if they were to say, they can't preach that here, they would say, I'm sorry, proconsul's already ruled in the KI that it was okay to preach it there, then it's okay to preach it here. So this allowed the gospel to be preached for at least 12, maybe 13 more years legally throughout the Roman Empire. But he reminded them, we are the guardian of Diana. She didn't think she needs a guardian, but apparently she does. And he mentions the image that fell down from the sky. Most likely there was some kind of a meteor that hit and they picked it up and said, look, it's a rock, it must be a god. That's, that's awesome. I love it. Pastor Skip Heitzig of Calvary Chapel in Albuquerque, he said, he said, if the image fell down from heaven, that's because God looked at the image and said, I don't want that in here. And he kicked it out of heaven too. He said, you guys can have it. I don't want it. This is the image. I don't know if you can see it very well. This is the image of Diana. Or she's known also as Artemis. I won't, I won't go into much detail, but she is anatomically incorrect because she is considered the goddess of fertility. So she... Leave alone. She's also the goddess of wild animals, the wilderness, and hunting. So that's why the wild animals are here on the, the base of the statue. But what's very interesting is that statue is on display at the Vatican. I have no idea why the Vatican would have a statue 
of the goddess Diana, a Greek goddess who's clearly not Christian, but nevertheless they do. So, so they thought they were the guardians of Diana. They need to make sure she's okay. She's not feeling bad. She's not being disrespected. And the city clerk says, just go home. Just go home. And they do. One win for the gospel yet again. Any questions about Acts chapter 19? Thoughts on Acts 19? Mama. Don't they, they, would, they think that she's a statue that represents a goddess out there somewhere. That she is a goddess, but this is just a statue that looks like her. But she's not there. And well, then there was a lot of magic worship and magic dealings in that town, so um, I'm sure you know, a lot of people that were profiting off of this ideology of Diana. Oh, yeah. And that's why they were mad, because they were making a profit, and now Paul's preaching the gospel. The gospel's changing people's lives, and now they're not making money anymore, and they're like, we've got to put a stop to this. Brother Ryan. Mm -hmm. I think that's one of the problems today. People are not convicted by sin. You're sure. right, sir. People are not. That's right. They need to be convicted. You know, according to Scripture, that's sinful. Right. I don't care. Right. I read, I read a quote by Adrian Rogers, who was a prolific preacher on the radio, and he said the problem with preachers nowadays is nobody wants to kill them anymore. <laughs> that makes you feel warm and fuzzy. All inside. Just hits you in the feel goods. But I understand what he's saying. If every time you come to church, you walk away saying, I'm a good person. I'm going to live my best life. I'm a good person. You're probably not hearing the gospel. And you're probably not hearing a call to holiness and a call to righteousness and godliness and a call to sacrifice. You're probably hearing that you're a good person. God's going to fulfill all your dreams and all of your wild wishes are going to come true. But you're probably not hearing we need to come to the altar and die. Right. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. You're probably not wearing steel toe. Probably just wearing sandals. It, so it doesn't talk on, so the gospel doesn't toast. Oh, gotcha. I was thinking you're not wearing steel toes because you don't expect your feet to get stepped on ever. <laughs> so the point is, the gospel now, and I mentioned this in the morning class, we should never offend in the way we deliver the gospel. If we do, that's on us. If we hurt people and offend them and drive them away because we are harsh and we don't show love, we don't speak the truth in love, that's our problem, not theirs. But if we speak the truth in love and they're offended because the gospel offends, well, that's what the gospel does. It's a sword. And it offends, it cuts, but it heals. It's much like a scalpel. It's going to hurt, but it will heal, and it will heal better. So we need conviction of sin. And so Paul's preaching that God's convicting them, and they're repenting, and God's changing their lives. Any other questions or thoughts on Acts 19? Let's pray a couple things. Let's pray that the Lord would let's pray the Lord would help us to make such a difference through our prayers, our discipleship, our, our work, not for the sake of salvation, but for the sake of discipleship, to reach others and help them. That even hell would take notice of what's going on here at Apostolic Church. And even hell would say, hmm, they're causing us some trouble down here. And then let's also pray that the Lord would help us to reach all of Mount Vernon. I would love to see whether it's through online or whether it's just us going in having Bible studies with families and, or them coming here and hearing the gospel, however God chooses or all of the above for the gospel to go from here to there and reach all of Mount Vernon and Knox County, much like it re reached all of Asia in just two short years. If it could reach all of Asia, we could certainly reach all of our county in just a short time. So let's pray for those things. Lord Jesus, thank you so much for your word tonight, what we've heard, what we've learned. Thank you, God, for what you inspired Luke to write. Thank you, Jesus, for this glorious gospel. Change our lives, Lord. I pray use us to make a difference. I pray, God, you would help us to do so much damage to the enemy and to his kingdom that they would take note of who we are and what we're doing. And I know you're with us. I know you're for us. I know you won't allow us to be destroyed. No weapon formed against us will prosper. So I'm asking you, Lord Jesus, help us to be bold. Help us to be courageous. God, give us a holy boldness to minister to people, to disciple people, to pray bold prayers, God-sized prayers. Use us to disciple people. 
God, I pray whether online, in cam on campus, in our homes, everywhere we are, use us to make a difference, to minister all around the, the county, that all of our county would hear and respond to the gospel. We're asking you, Lord, use us for your glory in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. Well, thanks for coming. Next week, Acts chapter 20. We continue our study. We're already in the 20s, which it only has 28 chapters, so we're getting close to the end. And then, if you can at all make it on Saturday, I know it's Easter Eve, but please come Saturday at 7 p.m. We're going to pray, and we're going to fill the sanctuary with our prayers. So on Sunday morning, God will fill it so full of his presence that everybody who comes here will be able to say, God is here, and he would transform their lives. So please join us, 7 p.m. for prayer on Saturday, and then Sunday morning, 10 for class, 11 for worship. If you brought your offering, there's a basket right there. Please drop it in there, and you're dismissed in Jesus' name.